I'm going to speak about how we should interpret the Canadian Constitution. And I'll start with saying why I think this is a valid and important question and not something that has already been answered for us by the Supreme Court. And then the, the main argument I will make is that we should interpret the Constitution in a way that makes sense in light of the nature of this thing, that what is the Constitution, what is it for? So its nature and purpose will tell us something about how it should be read by the courts, uh, as well as by the rest of us. And then I'll make a number of points about what I think the nature and purpose of the Constitution is, and I will look at how the major available families of interpretive theories deal uh, with those points or how they fare if we apply those uh, criteria that are derived from the nature of constitutions to see whether those interpretive methods do a good job or not. So why is the question of how to interpret the Constitution even important. You might think that the Supreme Court is right that this question is is settled uh, by the Persons case, and there is in the Attorney General of Canada, where the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council famously says that uh, the British North America Act planted in Canada a living tree. The Supreme Court has read that as saying that it can graft new branches to the living tree, that it can do reinterpret the Constitution in light of what it perceives to be contemporary realities and needs. In other cases, the Supreme Court has said that the right way to interpret the Constitution is the purposive approach. We read the Constitution in light of uh, the purposes that it provi its provisions were meant to serve. In some cases, uh, especially in the Como case, the Free the Beer case, a couple of years ago, the Supreme Court has said that those two approaches are, are one and the same. So you might think that we already know how, inter how to interpret the Constitution and why are people like me trying to make things complicated when they really are quite simple. The truth, I think, is that things are not as simple as the Supreme Court has suggested. Uh, for one thing, even among the, the two main methodologies that the Supreme Court has endorsed, once you start digging into them, you realize that purposivism and the living tree as applied by the Supreme Court are not the same. Uh, they are uh, typically, with, with some exceptions like Cole, but typically they are referred to in different cases. There is a purposive line of cases and there's a completely separate living tree line of cases. Um, and if you think about it, this makes sense because once you start thinking about the purposes of the Constitution, you may at least be tempted to think about the purposes of the people who made the Constitution because it's not as if the Constitution itself, it's an abstract inanimate object, uh, it's not as if it can have purposes of its own. Surely the purposes are those of people who created it. Uh, and then, and then that might lead you to some conclusions that are quite different from applying the living, living tree method, which is more concerned about the preferences and alleged needs of the people today. But there is more than that. There is also the fact the, that although it will not admit to it, the Supreme Court resorts to various forms of originalism on a somewhat regular basis, er erratically, but often enough. Uh, most recently in a case decided last year called Stillman, um, that was a case about the meaning of the phrase military law in section 11 of the charter. Section 11 says that one has a right to be tried by a jury, except in the case of offenses under military law. Well, what is military law? The majority of the Supreme Court looks to what this phrase meant in 1982. It looks to legislation that existed at the time, it looks to 
judicial decisions that had been decided prior to 1982. And it says, well, here is how this phrase was understood. And, and they say, well, the purpose was to, the purpose of this provision is to enshrine this meaning that existed in 1982. That sounds a lot like original meaning uh, dictating the import of the Constitution today. You go back a little bit further, there is an, any number of cases such as uh, the Senate reform reference where the court looks at the intentions of the framers in the 1860s. There is the um, reference, uh, the Nadal reference, reference uh, regarding the Supreme Court Act, uh, where the court looks at the intentions of the framers of the Supreme Court Act in 1875. Uh, there was the Cajon and Alberta case where the court uh, looks to whether the phrase legal rights would have been understood. So again, it's a reference to the original meaning of this provision would have been understood in 1870, not in 2015 or 16 when that case was decided, uh, but in 1870, would that phrase have been understood to include language rights? Uh, the dissenting opinion in that case doesn't say we can't look to what happened in 1870. It just says we have to look not to the meaning that this provision would have had, but to the intentions of the people who put it there. So the Supreme Court, although occasionally it will uh, make some disparaging comments about originalism, does in reality treat originalism as being one of the options that are available to it by no means always the preferred option, but in a sufficient number of cases, it is in fact the preferred option. So the question of which of these interpretive methodologies is the better one is on the table. It needs to be answered. Benjamin Oliphant and I have suggested in our work on the Supreme Court's use of originalism that it should be answered consistently. We didn't say then which way it should be answered, but there is a case to be made in the interest of the rule of law for at least answering it consistently. So my point today is to ask, well, how should we be answering this question and how should we think about answering this question? And as I suggested at the outset, the way to the better way to read a text, any text that would include the constitution, but certainly isn't limited to that, the way to think about how we should read a text should start off from well, what sort of text is it. So I'll give you an example, which is perhaps a trite example, uh, but I think it makes the point useful enough. Compare two kinds of texts that involve talking animals. One is fable, as of stables, of and stable, uh, fables. The other kind is a fairy tale. Uh, in both of these, you might find animals talking as if they were human, uh, but you should not read them the same way. When you read a fable, you know that what those animals are saying uh, and doing is not really about talking animals. It's, it's about humans, and the animals are just code for certain types of human personalities. In fairy tales, things are much more complicated. Maybe it really is about talking animals. Maybe there is a deeper message behind that. Uh, but it would probably be a mistake to read a fairy tale as if its uh, magical characters are just stand-ins for humans. And it would certainly be a mistake to read a fable as if it just was a story about magical talking animals. Uh, so knowing what sort of text your reading and what this text is intended to accomplish is very important. And the same is true, of course, when we come to legal texts. So again, compare the methods of reading contracts and statutes. A contract is an agreement, at least in the, the default paradigmatic case of a contract, it's an agreement between two people. So the uh, idea of uh, giving effect to the, the shared intention of those two people, even if they use language in some of the idiosyncratic ways, um, the focus is really on, on them and what they meant. Uh, of course, in the non-paradigmatic cases, of contracts of adhesion, where uh, only one person really dictated the terms, we also take that into account 
and we will read that contract a bit differently from one that was freely negotiated by, uh, by two individuals. And the statute is different because uh, it is not a private agreement among a limited number of parties. It's a document that is supposed to be read by the entire community and is supposed to be speaking to the entire community. So it's going to be read a little bit differently uh, with maybe more of an emphasis on uh, linguistic conventions and the ordinary meaning of the text than a contract. So again, knowing what sort of legal document we're dealing with is very important. Uh, and now I will argue that it is the same when it comes to constitutions. Uh, actually, I, th I think the idea stated at, at this level of generality should be fairly uncontroversial. Uh, the question will be then whether my description of constitutions, which is going to be more, more detailed than what I've said so far about fables and fairy tales and contracts and statutes, I will try to describe constitutions and perhaps one way, if you want to, to disagree with me, one question is, am I getting this description right? Am I missing something? Maybe, maybe my description is tendentious, maybe it's incomplete. So uh, that's one point uh, where we might want to, to disagree and have a debate. So I will argue that constitutions have six uh, characteristics, six traits that will influence the way in which we should be reading them. First of all, constitutions are democratic. They are ma made by what is considered to be a democratic process, at least at the time of their making. Uh, I'll return to this qualification later on, but at least and obviously I'm speaking to the constitutions of democratic states like Canada or the United States, uh, not the sort of fake constitutions like the ones that the Soviet Union had or, or the ones that China had uh, and has, but constitutions in democratic states, they result from a democratic process, often uh, usually a process involving some kind of supermajority consensus. Uh, but a process involving decisions made by elected officials and representatives, or perhaps in, in other cases, decisions made by a referendum. Well, that's the first point. Second, and related, constitutions reflect compromises. No constitution writer gets to implement all of his or her preferences precisely because constitutions are the result of democratic processes and often processes requiring very substantial consensus beyond even a simple majority, which is hard enough to, to get behind uh, a legal text, but often the requirement is for more than that. Uh, and so people, people need to agree, nobody gets exactly what they want. Uh, so sometimes people think of the Canadian Constitution or the 1867 Constitution as being the, the product of John A. Macdonald, and so it, it should uh, somehow reflect his preferences. But Macdonald didn't get everything he wanted, most obviously. He didn't get the uh, legislative union, the unitary state, which he would have preferred. He had to compromise, and he had to accept the federation. Similarly, in 1982, we might say, as a manner of speaking, that the charter uh, is uh, Pierre Trudeau's baby and uh, that it was he who drove its adoption, forced its adoption. And there is, of course, there is a certain part of truth to it, but the charter was certainly not simply a statement of Pierre Trudeau's uh, preferences. We know uh, that he had to compromise on any number of things, notwithstanding clause was one uh, obvious example. The, the charter is a failure to protect property rights, as uh, we know from Dwight Newman's research, uh, is also another case where Trudeau would have preferred a protection for property rights. He didn't get it because he had to compromise with Alan Blakeney, uh, which was a terrible thing, but it happened. And so uh, when we think about how to read the Constitution, we will also need to think about what consequences 
the fact that it's a result of a political and democratic compromise has. Third point about constitutions, they are meant to last. They are meant to last a long time. Nobody, I think, accepts Thomas Jefferson's idea that we should revise constitutions every 19 years because he thought that that was the, the duration of a generation. Uh, and he very famously said that uh, we should no more require a political community to live under the constitution of its parents then uh, we would require a man to wear the clothes that he wore when he was a little boy uh, but nobody thinks like that anymore and very few people did even at Je in jefferson's time uh, so constitutions are supposed to last and uh, to apply in circumstances that are quite different from the ones that their framers uh, were familiar with I think we should be careful with this argument. We shouldn't take it too far. We know that human nature actually changes a lot less than people sometimes suppose. If you don't believe me, read Thucydides, read about uh, the Athenian democracy of 2,400 years ago, uh, and I think you will be persuaded. Uh, but it's true that the world around us changes quite a bit, uh, and, Constitutions need to uh, be sufficiently adaptable to uh, this changing world. Uh, and, and their framers know this, uh, and their drafting of the constitutions reflects this knowledge. Uh, our reading of the constitutions should also reflect it. Fourth, constitutions should or hopefully will ensure a certain minimum level of decency in government. They are not cure-alls. They are not meant to be responses to every conceivable social problem. Uh, it's quite clear that all the constitutions that we know of, uh, and certainly the Canadian constitution, don't address everything that people might think a good or just or decent society requires. Constitutions create the conditions in which the political process can provide for good and just government. But they do assure a certain minimum level below which the political process is not supposed to, to go. And this brings me to the fifth point, which is that constitutions are meant to constrain government. They are meant to limit what government is, is able to do uh, in pursuit of its policy objectives or even in the pursuit of justice. Constitutions constrain governments in at least two main ways. On the one hand, they impose a certain structure on government which results in government decisions being made through specific channels uh, and by institutions whose authority is fragmented and, and limited. On the other hand, constitutions also constrain government in that they require it to impose certain, uh, to respect certain fundamental rights. At least, again, that's not every constitution does both of these things, but the Canadian constitution, as we know, does. Uh, it imposes on the one hand structure of government with, for example, a certain separation between the political branches and the judiciary, with a federal structure of government um, as well. And on the other hand, we have now a part of the constitution that's called the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and that clearly is meant to protect certain fundamental rights, as are certain other provisions of, of the Constitution, in particular Section 35 of the 1982 Constitution, which protects Aboriginal rights, uh, perhaps also some provisions of the 1867 Constitution as well. And finally, uh, but no less importantly, constitutions Again, the Constitution of Canada, at least, and those of many other comparable jurisdictions, 
are legal instruments. They are legal texts. They are not just political commitments. You could argue that constitutions of uh, polities like New Zealand are primarily political commitments, even though they take a, a legal form uh, or parts of them take a legal form. Uh, but the Canadian constitution is the supreme law of Canada. It says so itself in section 52.1 of the Constitution Act 1982. So we need to think about what the legality of the Constitution means. And so with these six criteria or six points about what the constitutions are like in mind, again, constitutions are democratic, they're compromises, they are meant to last, they're meant to provide for minimally decent but not comprehensively good government. They are meant to constrain government both through structural provisions and by protecting fundamental rights and they are legal instruments. With this in mind, we can take a detailed look at how the main interpretive methodologies that are on the table how do these methodologies compare? So I'll compare living constitutionalism with originalism. I will uh, fold purposivism, I will ignore it if you will, or I will fold it into those two main alternatives. Depending on how purposivism is done, it might look more like living constitutionalism or a lot like originalism, uh, as for example in the Stillman case that I discussed in the beginning. Of, uh, of my talk. So I'll start with living constitutionalism and then I'll do originalism. What I mean by living constitutionalism is the idea that the courts are entitled to say that, well, the constitution, first of all, the constitution means what its reader today would say it means, not what its readers would have said it meant at the time when it was enacted. And the original meaning or intentions of the people uh, behind the, the framing of the Constitution are not binding on its contemporary interpreters. This implies that contemporary interpreters can change the Constitution in comparison to what it would have been like in the past, they can, as some uh, Supreme Court judges have suggested, graft branches onto the living tree that is the Constitution. They can, as the majority of the Supreme Court said in a case called uh, Saskatchewan Federation of Labor, they can give constitutional benediction to rights that we didn't know were part of the Constitution, and now the Supreme Court says, well, it's time for this right to be part of the Constitution, because in this way, we can respond to the needs and preferences of contemporary society. And the needs and preferences and understandings of the past are not binding on us. So that's what I mean by living constitutionalism. I don't mean to be snarky about it. Uh, this is, I think, a relatively, uh, it should be a relatively non-controversial description of what the Supreme Court does in some of those cases. And just one caveat, the court will sometimes say that it applies a living constitutional method, and maybe it conceives of its decision as being living constitutionalist, but actually the, the outcome if not also the reasoning is perfectly consistent with a form of originalism. Uh, so I'm, I'm leaving that to one side. And again, the uh, perhaps most, most uh, salient representatives of what I have in mind when I speak of living constitutionalism are those, uh, the Saskatchewan Federation of Labor case and, and also the Como case where the Supreme Court says it doesn't really matter what 
the framers of the Constitution uh, meant in 1867 when they said that all articles of growth uh, or manufacture have to be admitted free into from one province into another. Uh, whatever they meant by admitted free, we have our own idea today of what internal free trade should be like so as not to disrupt the needs of contemporary society, which include very heavy regulation, according to the Supreme Court in, in that case. Um, so that's what I have in mind when I say living constitutionalism. So how does living constitutionalism compare to those, how does it implement those facts about constitutions generally? So let's start with democracy. Living constitutionalism, I suggest, is not democratic because it means that the content of the constitution at any given point in time is a reflection of the ideas and preferences of the judiciary. And the judiciary in Canada is not a democratic branch of government. The if the judges can give benediction to new rights, those rights are created by people who were appointed to the Supreme Court. They are not created by the people themselves or by democratically elected representatives. Of course, there are, are limits on just how democratic the process of constitution making can be. I'll return to that when I speak about originalism. Uh, but in any case, the making and remaking of a constitution by the nine judges of the Supreme Court, I think can have no democratic claim uh, to, uh, to its legitimacy. So that's the first criteria. Second, constitutions are compromises. I would suggest that the possible remaking of constitutions from time to time by the courts will undermine the compromises made by politicians. And indeed, the Supreme Court is well aware of this because it does say in relation to some rights, to some rights uh, in the charter, to language rights in particular, the Supreme Court will say, well, it's not appropriate for us to start living treeing this thing and just saying what language rights there should be in Canada. Wouldn't it be appropriate for us to give benediction to new language rights because these provisions, they reflect political compromises uh, and so it would not be appropriate for us to disturb those uh, compromises that were made by the framers. In other areas, the Supreme Court has no such compunctions. And so I would suggest that living constitutionalism is disruptive of what constitutions are and are meant to be. Third, Constitutions are supposed to be adaptable over time. This is the, the great strength of living constitutionalism. Uh, this is probably the number one thing to which its defenders will point. Uh, living constitutionalism is intended to allow constitutions to speak to the needs of the present. The courts are thought of as being the translators of those needs, the adapters of constitutions to the needs of the day. We might wonder about how effective the, the courts are at this uh, translation and adaptation. How much do the courts really know about contemporary society? Uh, they are, after all, insulated from the society through their uh, land, the fact that they are not elected and they're not accountable to the political process. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the again, I, as I see, the main point of living constitutionalism is to allow those uh, texts and ideas which, of course, come to us in, in the case of the Charter from almost 40 years ago, in the case of the 1867 Constitution from over 150 years now, uh, to be uh, meaningful and useful to us today. 
forth, we said constitutions are meant to be min minimally decent. And this is another area where living constitutionalism might be helpful because it might allow the courts to introduce the new understandings of what it means for a constitution to be minimally decent. Uh, and so this helps the constitution stay uh, with the times and ensure that government respects certain minimum standards as they are understood from time to time. But there is, there is a complexity here, which is, I think, not sufficiently appreciated by many of the defenders of living constitutionalism, which is that what is thought to be decent can, uh, the, the, the standard of dis decency can go up or down. It may be thought, for example, that the modern times are such that more it's uh, necessary to restrict individual freedoms in ways that wouldn't have been contemplated in the past. And whether the courts that uh, reinterpret the constitution will always treat it as a one-way ratchet that always progresses in terms of moral development. We're always better today than we were yesterday and we always provide greater protection for rights than we did in the past, this is very doubtful. There are examples in uh, Canadian history of uh, judicial calls for reduced protect protections for individual rights. Uh, my, my personal favorite is the famous padlock law case, Switzman and Elbing. Um, in that case, uh, Justice Tashro, who dissented, uh, said that, uh, you know, communism is a real, real danger. Uh, and so whatever might have been the, the scope of federal uh, power uh, over criminal law and the limits on the provincial power and property and civil rights, we need to bend those rules a little bit uh, because we need to make sure that our governments has, uh, have all the means at their dispos disposal to prevent the spread of communism. And his great argument, which is not stated very uh, clearly at all in the decision, so I think um, contemporary readers might miss it, but he appeals to what he says, what know that less than 10 years ago, uh, people broke oaths to the, uh, that they swore uh, in order to subvert our system of government uh, and advance the cause of communism. Well, what is he talking about? He's talking about the Guzenka affair, which led to uh, Commission of Inquiry into Communist Activities uh, in Canada. And those communist activities were real. The infiltration of Canada and the US by uh, Soviet agents was very real. Uh, but it also is true that the, the inquiry was uh, conducted in ways that are quite shameful. Uh, people were detained without uh, without charge. They were held without being able to uh, have a lawyer represent them. They were forced to answer questions, including when those answers uh, incriminated them. Uh, so it, it was a massive and systematic violation of uh, our fundamental notions of due process, uh, in which a number of the uh, Current, then sitting and future judges of the Supreme Court were actually complicit. Uh, and it would seem that some of them, uh, the others, except for Justice Tashro, seem to have had a bit of a change of heart. Uh, but Justice Tashro was unrepentant, and he thought it was very important to uh, bend the rules in order to make sure that the, the Constitution didn't stand in the way of saving the country from communism. So what is understood by decency uh, from time to time, can uh, the, the standards can go up or they can go down. And living constitutionalism may provide for greater protections or it may not. And this leads me to the next point, which is about constraint. 
living constitutionalism may or may not constrain political branches. Uh, of course, it, it may, as I have just been saying, it may, may uh, allow the courts to uh, impose greater constraints on political, the political branches of government than they would have in the past, or the courts may use uh, their powers of reinterpreting the constitution to actually uh, reduce the constraints that way on the political branches. But the other point which is important to, to highlight is that living constitutionalism conspicuously fails to constrain the courts themselves. The courts themselves are enabled to rewrite the constitution and I think it is telling that defenders of living constitutionalism don't say very much about how they are going to do it or what the limits of this rewriting power are. Uh, so the courts, which I think we need to realize, the courts themselves are also a branch of government. They are different from the political branches. They do not respond to the popular feelings and pressures of the moment in the same way. But the courts are nevertheless a branch of government with coercive powers over us. And we should ideally want them to be constrained as well as the political branches. Living constitutionalism may or may not constrain the politicians, but it provides no real constraint on judges. And finally, in terms of the requirements of uh, legality, the fact that constitutions are legal instruments and should therefore compl uh, comply with our ideas about legality, uh, I'll refer to what I think is a relatively uncontroversial statement of the requirements of legality, uh, the one that is developed by Lon Fuller in his uh, famous book, The Morality of Law. Uh, so Lon Fuller describes a number of criteria which a system of rules uh, should meet in order to be considered a properly legal system or criteria that a system of government should meet in order to be entitled to call itself a government of laws, a government through laws. Um, and so I'll go through those criteria and see how they, uh, how they fare uh, or how the, the interpretive methodologies fare as measured against those criteria. And Fuller's first criteria, which I'm not going to say much about because uh, I think both living constitutionalism and uh, originalism are, are fine uh, when measured against it is the requirement that there should be general rules as opposed to just ad hoc uh, case by case decision making. Uh, both living constitutionalism and originalism try to treat the constitution as a, as a general rule. The question is how do we ascertain the import and meaning of that general rule. But with the other criteria that Fuller sets out, things are more complicated. Uh, let's start with the, the good news for living constitutionalism. Uh, it does, it may do well on a couple of those criteria. Uh, one is the requirement of coherence among the legal rules. Legal rules uh, should not be contradictory and ideally they should uh, be a coherent whole. Living constitutionalism may, depending on the circumstances, but it, it may help the courts ensure that the rules of constitutional law are coherent with uh, the more general legal rules, which uh, we may expect to be adjusted more frequently than the constitutional rules. Uh, constitutional rules are more difficult to adjust and so a system of living constitutionalism may, depending on the circumstances, but may uh, help the courts generate greater coherence within the legal system as a whole. Uh, it may, living constitutionalism may also promote the um, requirement of non-impossibility of compliance. So Fuller says 
legal rules should be such that it is possible to comply with them. Uh, and, and living constitutionalism may make it easier uh, for both the courts and other decision makers to comply with constitutional rules. Uh, the, the best known example of this is uh, Justice Scalia's famous statement that he's a faint-hearted originalist because he could not possibly accept that the punishment of flogging is uh, constitutional, is consistent with the, the prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment. Justice Scalia says, well, in 1789, when the uh, U.S. Bill of Rights was being drafted, uh, it may well be that flogging was okay. So an originalist might say that uh, it's not cruel and unusual to inflict this punishment on people today, uh, but Justice Scalia says, well, I can't possibly comply with that. Uh, now, it's very debatable whether Justice Scalia was right about what originalism has to say about flogging. Randy Burnett has uh, contradicted him on this, I think, quite persuasively by pointing out that uh, a properly proper originalist interpretation doesn't require you to uh, accept anything that was considered not cruel in 1789. It just tells a judge to think about what is and what is not cruel. There is no list in this prohibition of what is and what is not acceptable. On the contrary, there is a board that appeals you know, conspicuously, conspicuously to moral reasoning and tells the judges to engage in moral reasoning. Uh, so perhaps the, the uh, advantages of living constitutionalism on this front uh, are not all that we might think they are, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it may be that depending on the circumstances, uh, living constitutionalism has something going for it uh, on this criterion. Living constitutionalism may uh, also help uh, the constitution be more uh, understandable, more intelligible uh, to contemporary readers. Uh, so those, uh, those I would say, are pro probably the, the points on which living constitutionalism can, at least in some cases, contribute to uh, better compliance with the requirements of legality. But it, it has its downsides, uh, and they are very serious. Uh, first of all, living constitutionalism does very poorly measure uh, against the requirement of legal stability because it tells the courts that they can rewrite the law and change the law if they think this is useful or necessary. They can one day decide that it's time to uh, give benediction to a new right. Uh, we know that in, in this particular area, in uh, the area of the rights of labor unions, uh, Canadian law has changed again and again and again and again from the original uh, trilogy in the late 80s to the Dunmore case in 2002 to health services uh, in 2007 and then on and on and on. Uh, so, uh, Living constitutionalism undermines the stability of constitutional law. Living constitutionalism also goes against the requirement that law be public because we don't know what the constitution actually is. It's only in the heads of Supreme Court judges un until the day they decide. Living constitutionalism fails the uh, test of non-retroactivity because it uh, allows the courts to apply new rules to government decisions that were made under a different set of legal rules. And the Supreme Court has actually acknowledged this. They have said that when we engage in legal constitutionalism, we are springing a surprise on legislatures. They didn't know that certain things were not okay uh, un until the day we tell them. And I think this, this is a, an issue that we should be concerned about because after all, legislatures, uh, at least ideally, supposedly, represent our preferences. And so if we as voters 
uh, want to pursue a certain policy and our representatives uh, agree to pursue it and they think that they have the constitutional ability to pursue it and then they are told by the courts uh, that no, actually you weren't allowed to do this, you couldn't possibly know, but now we're telling you that you weren't allowed. Uh, we have suffered a loss and not just the, the politicians. And last but not least, Fuller's list of the requirements of legality includes this uh, idea of congruence between the law as it is stated and the law as it is applied. We cannot have an environment of legality if the law is applied in a way that departs from the way in which it was communicated to the people who were bound by this law. And living constitutionalism, for similar reasons, uh, also fails this requirement because the law of the constitution is, uh, over time, becomes more and more different from what the constitution was originally said and supposed to be. So this is, this is it for uh, living constitutionalism. To recap, it's not, it's not very democratic at all. It's not democratic at all. Uh, it undermines compromises made in the enactment of constitutions. It may be quite useful in adapting constitutions over long periods of time. It may either support the uh, decency of government by modifying uh, requirements to adjust with the moral progress of society, but it may also undermine the decency of government if the social standards are regressing. It uh, may or may not provide for greater constraint of the political branches of government, but it fails to constrain the courts. And finally, living constitutionalism may assist with the coherence of the legal system in particular, uh, but fails to ensure that it is uh, stable and that its rules are uh, public perspective and are applied in the way they are stated. And now I will turn to originalism as an alternative. Again, I'm going to I'm not going to go into much detail about what sort of originalism I have in mind or various shades and flavors of originalism. Uh, but the, the common denominator, as explained by Warren Solom, uh, is that originalism accepts two main, uh, two, uh, two main claims. One is what Professor Solon calls the uh, fixation thesis. The meaning of the Constitution is fixed at the time when the Constitution is enacted. To the extent that the Constitution has a definitive meaning, it is fixed. And second, the constraint thesis, which uh, holds that the, interpretives, uh, the interpreters of the Constitution are bound by its original meaning that was fixed at the time of its enactment. So how does originalism correspond to the nature of constitutions? On the democracy point, uh, of course, originalism does not reflect the de democracy of today, but it does reflect the democratic uh, decisions are made at the time when the constitution was enacted. Now, the, here's the caveat on that, which uh, critics of originalism often bring up. Democratic processes of the past, processes, political processes that were considered democratic in the past, may not be very democratic by our contemporary lights. Uh, in 1867, women were denied the ability to participate in the process of making the Canadian Constitution. Aboriginal Canadians were denied the ability to participate in the making of the Canadian Constitution. The uh, very poor were excluded from the democratic process as well. There were the uh, wealth requirements 
were not very high, but they existed. So some people were excluded from uh, the democratic process on that basis. So we today would not regard uh, the democracy of 1867 as acceptable. And, and that's something that uh, counts against the democratic legitimacy of, of originalism. Although, of course, to repeat, it was still a form of democracy, a very imperfect form of democracy, uh, but it's, uh, so it involved limited participation uh, and perhaps biased participation, uh, but certainly not more limited than the participation of nine persons on the Supreme Court today. Uh, the other response that is very important to make is that contrary to people have sometimes suggested, I'm not sure why they would suggest it, uh, but the making of the 1982 constitution and what arguably is the 1982 implicit ratification of the 1867 constitution. That was the result of a properly democratic process that was not meaningfully less uh, inclusive than the one of today, at least insofar as every group that every uh, significant group that was excluded from democracy in 1867 was included by 1982. The, the only uh, the people who were still denied uh, the ability to participate were uh, mainly uh, prisoners and judges. But at least all the major groups in society were able to take part. We know that in particular the process of drafting the charter with the uh, special committee on the constitution, joint committee of the Senate and House of Commons, which received uh, submissions from a very wide variety of individuals and groups in the civil society. Uh, that was uh, a process of uh, arguably exemplary inclusivity. Uh, and so the at least the 1982 part of our constitution, I think we can say and proudly say is genuinely democratic. Uh, and, and so, critiques on the, based on the imperfection of, uh, of democracy that are directed at originalism, I think, are not availing against the 1982 constitution, whatever their weight against the 1867 one. Second, uh, uh, political compromises. Originalism, insofar as it upholds the uh, meaning of the constitution that was fixed at the time it was made, is meant to uphold compromises uh, instead of undermining them in the way that living constitutionalism can do. Third, adaptability of constitutions over time. In some ways, originalism stands athwart, athwart history and seeks to uh, limit the ability of the courts to adapt the constitution to changing times. Uh, I will argue, I have already suggested, further argue that it's not necessarily a bad thing, but in some circumstances it can be a defect. That said, we shouldn't underestimate the adaptability of originalism in, in that, as I've already explained with, uh, for example, this example of the protection against cruel and unusual punishment. The framers of constitutions know that they are writing for the future and not just for the past and the present. And so they will draft their work accordingly. They will use broad terms. They will use terms that appeal to moral reasoning, like cruel. They will use terms that appeal to practical reason, uh, reasoning, such as the, the uh, protection against unreasonable searches and seizures. What is unreasonable uh, is something that falls for the courts to be determined in light both of moral considerations that have to do with privacy and practical considerations as well. Uh, drafters, uh, the drafters of the charter have also, for example, when they prohibited discrimination, they uh, didn't fix the list of grounds of discrimination. Uh, they said the prohibited grounds include 
a certain list and the, the courts have been quite properly able to extend uh, this list to what are known as analogous grounds. Uh, so the, uh, let's give some credit to the people who wrote the constitutions. Uh, they knew that the constitution would be used over time in different circumstances. And so in some places they have fixed the rules definitively. In others, they have left space for adaptation. And it would be as wrong for the court to refuse to uh, engage in this kind of moral and uh, practical reasoning when the constitutional text calls for it, as it would be for the courts to start rewriting the terms that are clear and fixed. Fourth, how does originalism do in terms of upholding the minimum uh, standards of decency for government? Well, as I've already suggested, uh, originalism can ensure that the courts apply those fixed standards even when there is a lot of pressure from society and from the political process against them. So while originalism may mean that the moral progress of society is not reflected, uh, is not incorporated into the constitution without formal amendment, it certainly doesn't prevent moral progress from uh, being reflected in ordinary legislation, but if you want to incorporate it into the constitution, you will need uh, an amendment for that, and amendments may be difficult to secure, uh, but on the other hand, if society is uh, temporarily or at least, or even for the long term, if society is morally regressing, the fixation of the constitution can serve as a form of protection, at least for some period of time, against this regression. So if you are more cautious, if you are more risk averse, if you are not very optimistic about moral progress continuing unabated and uninterrupted, uninterrupted forever and ever, then you should probably prefer an originalist approach to interpretation. If you are an optimist, if you think that uh, the uh, things will always be better in terms of morality and decency in society than they were in the past, then you may prefer living constitutions. Next, uh, the requirement of constraint. Originalism is supposed to constrain both the political branches and the courts. Now, early originalists may have sinned by an excess of confidence there. Uh, they may have said that their methodology was able to provide perfect constraint on government and the courts, and that was probably a mistake. Depending on the nature of your originalism, it may be more or less constraining. It's also true that courts may fail to properly apply originalism in some cases. Uh, but if the courts are genuinely committed to respecting the fixation and constraint requirements of originalism, this will bind them to some extent, again, also depending on the, the nature of the constitutional text itself. The more precise a text, the more constraining it will be. The more broadly stated the text, the less constraining it will be. But that choice then will have fallen to the framers of the text and not to the court saying, well, you know, we can disregard whatever constraints were meant to be imposed on us. So originalism does not provide perfect constraint, but it provides uh, at least some measure of constraint depending on the constitutional text. And finally, in terms of the requirements of legality, the same requirements of legality I've mentioned above, as I've already suggested, uh, originalism as compared to living constitutionalism uh, may have some weaknesses when it comes to coherence uh, of the legal system and the uh, 
possibility of complying with the rules. But originalism does much better in uh, promoting stability, in ensuring that the rules that were publicly stated when the constitution was enacted remain the rules and so everybody can know what the rules are. The rules are applied in a manner that is consistent with the way they were stated, at least insofar as they were stated clearly. Uh, so on those points, originalism does better than living constitutionalism. And uh, of course, on the point, uh, the requirement of prospectivity, the constitution is enacted once and for the future until it is changed. So we avoid uh, when judges engage in originalist interpretation, they avoid this uh, phenomenon of announcing new rules that weren't known in the past. So to recap, once again, originalism is uh, supportive of democracy, although with this asterisk that the democracy of the past may or may not be satisfactory by our contemporary standards. Uh, originalism seeks to uphold the compromises that went into the making of constitutions. Uh, it uh, is somewhat, but not fully adaptable to changing times and circumstances. Uh, but on the flip side, this ensures that uh, courts continue to protect individual uh, rights and uh, continue to uphold the standards of decency in government uh, against regressions which may well occur from time to time hopefully not forever but from time to time uh, originalism constrains both the political branches and the courts uh, at least to the extent that the constitution itself is uh, framed in terms that are more constraining than permissive. Uh, and originalism does pretty well in terms of complying with the requirements of legality, and in particular in that it ensures that the, con the constitution can be a framework of public, stable, prospective law which can then be applied in accordance with its known terms. So based on this, I think it is very clear that originalism, although it doesn't win on every point, uh, is overall much preferable to living constitutionalism. So if we want to interpret the constitution in a way that is consonant with the nature of what it is and with the purposes that it is supposed to serve, then we should interpret, approach constitutional interpretation as originalists rather than as living constitutionalists. Thank you.